Welcome back, everyone. We're coming to uh, close on our journey in nutrition for food technology. And kudos to all of you in the program at Niagara College for sticking it out for this first time online course. Um, we're going to uh, pull a lot of themes together today and talk about decision making in nutrition in that we've been reviewing all sorts of different pieces of evidence throughout our time together and thinking about all of the different ways that we as food technologists and food scientists may be making decisions related to nutrition quality. And it could be related to our product development where we're going about doing cost assessment or uh, creating nutrition facts tables as part of our marketing and part of our regulatory requirements. But in the end, every single product that we might be developed has to start with that initial step is this the right product for our organization? And in the case of nutrition-oriented products, there's so many uh, decisions that you have to make. And I wanted to think about the decision-making process because honestly, um, it's a question that I've often asked by young professionals. How do you get better at knowing what to launch? And it comes down to these decision-making skills. Do you understand how you make decisions and as such become better at being able to make those decisions. So let's jump out here. At the end of this video, you'll be able to identify some of the psychological constructs that define decision making. We'll define how these constructs impact on how the food and nutrition industry creates demand. And we'll justify how you make decisions related to nutrition and health. And in, in the end, it's a fine balance, and, and I often say this to the students, that if you understand your decision-making process and are able to articulate it, you will be feeling better and have a, have a much better cognition towards those decisions. I always, I always um, yell at the students when we're together, I wish I could teach you intuition, and intuition really is effective decision-making, to be able to use the facts and uh, information available to you in an effective way. So another reason I wanted to talk about this topic is that I have been reading some of the books by Timothy Caulfield, and I encourage you to take a look at some of his books because they are very fascinating. He talks a lot about um, decision-making processes. He's a professor of law at the University of Alberta, and he's the research director for the Health Law Institute, and he's a Canada Research Chair in Health Law and Policy, and he has some great public-facing books, um, not just his research, but his, his public books are very accessible, and what I like about them is that he discusses the uh, the understanding of science within the public realm, and Honestly, this is something that as food scientists, we need to be very aware of that we as food scientists are making scientific decisions and passing on that judgment to our consumers. And in many cases, the consumers are the ones driving the demand and we need to understand what their uh, decision making processes are so that we can either decide, do we, uh, do we jump on that demand for a product, even if the science and the facts are not legitimate. Obviously, we have to meet the regulatory compliance, but in many cases, we are jumping on demand from consumers where the science doesn't back it. And when do we go through that cognitive dissonance and say, you know what, this is acceptable? So thinking about cognitive dissonance, I put up this photo, uh, the stock photo of uh, skydivers, because in one of um, Dr. Caulfield's books, he was writing about going skydiving with his with his teenage son and how he <laughs> taking this teenager his the rest of his family was was absolutely beside themselves but he kept saying if you really uh, equate the risks going skydiving with a skydiving instructor is less risky um, than driving to the skydiving range because the risk of of traffic accidents is actually much, much higher than it is to go skydiving. The challenge is that the, the risk of skydiving and accidents in skydiving have a much higher prevalence within the, within the media. And, and the impact of that 
is so much greater. We do not, we do not as a, as a human species, equate well the difference between the impact of a risk and the, the frequency of a risk. And we, we, we misunderstand the risk calculus that oftentimes those smaller cumulative risks that are occurring much with much greater frequency are the ones that actually are the ones that are going to do us the most harm. We instead gravitate towards risks that have a much higher impact, but a ridiculously small frequency within normal life. And that that's that's uh, part of uh, part of the cognitive dissonance that we have as human beings. So what is cognitive dif dif eh, dissonance? Pardon me, I'm a food scientist. I'm not a psychologist and I'm not a social scientist, but I feel that this is really important. So cognitive dissonance is when behaviors, attitudes, knowledge, or values do not align, causing mental anguish or frustration. And oftentimes the, the description of cognitive dissonance would be people know to not smoke, but there are plenty of people who smoke and they know their behavior doesn't align with the knowledge and values that they have in their mind. And so they change their attitude about it and they'll find justifications. So there's this shifting between all of these different factors, the behaviors, attitudes, knowledge, and values that shift so that you move towards a space of less mental anguish. And we are constantly uh, bombarded in our daily lives with cognitive dissonance and we need to be reconciling it through our decisions. One key feature in food and, uh, food and nutrition science is uh, this post-decision dissonance. And this is where you go about justifying your decision after the fact to make the best out of the situation. And also the idea of having a feedback loop that when you've made a decision, you'll keep making similar decisions to reinforce your lifestyle. So it's sort of an internalized peer pressure. If, if you say, I want to be eating healthy, um, even though the science might not align saying um, organic or uh, GMO free foods are they're, they're nu not nutritionally superior, they may have other um, social or economic benefits to the producers. But from a nutrition perspective, organic and uh, GMO free are not, they're not nutritionally superior in general than their, than their uh, conventional counterparts. But Oftentimes, if you say, I'm leading a, a healthy lifestyle and I want to eat nutritious, then you're going to choose other halo type effect um, um, components or third party labeling uh, programs that uh, represent those same values. And so you get into this sort of feedback loop that if I've made one decision, then I need to make multiple decisions. I know in, in our class, we've, I've talked about how from a marketing perspective, you can start to get clutter. Uh, when you start to overlay too many claims, but at the same time, that that aspect of having lots and lots of feedback loops, internalized decision making. Let's jump ahead here. Knowledge error paradox is another um, aspect of decision making that uh, Dr. Caulfield writes extensively about, and that right now in in the world, the quality or the quantity of, pardon me, the quantity of knowledge is outstanding. Uh, we all walk around, most of us, with a smartphone, and more or less the world's knowledge is right there available to us. The quantity of scientific knowledge is absolutely exponential. And the sheer number of scientific papers that are being written on a, on a daily basis is absolutely ridiculous. That said, um... Access to information is easier, but our scientific literacy is extremely low as a general population. And as such, people tend to jump on the bandwagon of things that are amplified by hype. And people don't understand the, uh, the difference between correlation and causation. I know we've spoken about this in a different YouTube video uh, earlier in the semester, but they, they really don't understand that the scientific, uh, the scientific community is, it's a continuum. Oftentimes, the science will um, fluctuate back and forth as the community comes to a consensus. And meanwhile, it's easy for members of the general public to access this science and cherry pick the sort of information that supports their, their 
attitudes and behaviors. And the, meanwhile, they lack the literacy to be able to evaluate the quality of that science. And you as new professionals in the food science and technology field may also fall into this trap. And I know we've spoken about how do you evaluate the scientific literature? Um, it's challenging. It's it's very challenging. I, I've, I've been doing this for 20 years and I still get challenged by it because inevitably, inevitably there are there are all sorts of different metrics on evaluating what is the nature and quality. Go back to that decision making piece. For you as a food scientist, it's easy to cherry pick and say, I've found a paper that supports my my opinion. Um, but to review the vastness of all of the knowledge that is there and to be able to make a grand theory is much more difficult. And the challenge in the nutrition in the nutrition segment is that many of these grand theories are actually not that exciting. Eat more fruits and vegetables, eat less meat, drink less alcohol, um, avoid sugar. Um, a lot of this is it's it's so mundane that it doesn't capture the attention of people anymore. And it's difficult to be able to make a marketing message from that. Another decision-making factor that many uh, people will use is the less risk paradox. And this is actually very common in the food industry. Um, that be, uh, consumers will choose scenarios that have less risk. And oftentimes uh, from a marketing and product development perspective, you'll imply that by consuming this product, you are reducing some health-related risk. And meanwhile, in the case of nutrition, the, the, the high-risk nutrition impacts are the mundane ones. Obesity, um, that's, a, that's a calories in, calories out scenario for the most part. And um, it's very difficult to have people change their behaviors about uh, consumption. And, and it's difficult for the food manufacturing sector to have a part to play in that, in that we are trying to sell more product. And therefore, how do we justify from a food manufacturing perspective, the fact that we're constantly trying to sell more product? Anyways, back to, back to uh, choosing these scenarios. Consumers are consistently saying, well, if I'm choosing the product that is somehow imposing less risk on myself, that's going to be a net benefit. But at the same time, we are also hardwired to um, a wide variety of foods that um, countervene. Few people go in, into the grocery store and say, boy, celery is my first choice versus the potato chips or the chocolate bar or the, the cookies. Um, knowing full well that um, we are hardwired for that less risk scenario, but we're also hardwired in the food industry um, and, and as consumers to be choosing products that are perhaps actually intrinsically more risky for us. In the nutrition sector, um, from a marketing and advertising perspective, there's a lot of fear mongering and there's a lot of manufactured fear. Um, I was thinking of a product that was just released. It was an alcoholic seltzer uh, produced uh, by a company in Canada and they were uh, advertising it as containing antioxidants. And we know very well that alcoholic beverages cannot have a halo effect um, for these sorts of ingredients. And the health claim of antioxidant uh, can't be also pronounced on, on a product of that sort. And meanwhile, they're, they're taking advantage of the fear-mongering of nutrition, health, and wellness in this period of COVID, such that uh, they're creating manufactured fear and using, using uh, offhanded marketing tactics to create paranoid need for a product. Um, and oftentimes marketers take advantage of that uh, aspect that consumers have very little conceptualization of risk and they can't understand that the, the product that they're consuming actually doesn't change that risk metric. But they uh, the marketers conflate the ability of the product to overcome that risk. So, jump for here. Oh, the perfection paradox. This one's a good one. Um, in the case of nutrition science, oftentimes we're taking advantage of the fact that people want to be moving towards a state of perfection. And there is a, there's, there's a mantra in um, Western society to always be uh, continuously improving oneself. And admittedly, I will go out there and say, continuously improve your mind. Admittedly, um, 
I'm getting older. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm getting old and stiff, but uh, I'm out there constantly saying, keep on learning, keep on growing um, and keep on improving yourself. Um, we have this Western mindset that you need to keep moving yourself towards perfection and that perfection in your appearance, your perfection in your mind, perfection in your relationships and so on. And meanwhile, perfection just isn't there. Um I, I don't want to dismiss the fact that I want you to keep on learning and I want you to keep on growing, but I, I also acknowledge the fact that it's impossible to learn everything and perfection in learning is impossible. But um, within the nutrition sector, going back to the key feature of this uh, presentation, the nutrition sector exploits this perfection paradox that if you eat this product, you are somehow making yourself better Um better for your you're exuding that perfection also to your family and to the people that you are feeding in your in your household and meanwhile we know very well that no food is going to create perfection but somehow that's something that we're exploiting on a consistent basis Ooh, the availability heuristic heuristics is the, is is the actual study of decision making and um this is another one um mentioned in uh, Dr. Caulfield's book, uh, it, it's a recent book called Relax, Damn It, and it's a, it's a fun read about uh, imagining all the decisions people made during the day, and many of them are related to food, and I do encourage you to check out the book. Um, the availability heuristic is that we are often uh, making our decisions based off of what we have heard and um, been exposed to most recently. We don't tend to go back in history um, when it comes to making food decisions. That said, that said, there are innate memories that drive our decision making. But uh, describing what the availability heuristic is, is that if, if a product has been in recent news and in a lot of hype within the, uh, within the recent um, documentation that's been going on, we tend to go about making our decision based on that. So think about plant-based foods. Um, there's been so much media exposure about transitioning to plant-based foods that I think a lot of people, when they're in the marketplace making decisions about foods, often see that plant-based label and jump on it, even though that plant-based label may be an exaggeration of a pre-existing product. So for example, when I saw plant-based uh, plant-based margarine recently. I'm like, this is a product that has always been plant-based and I'm not sure why now they're jumping on that hype, but because of the availability heuristic and the amount of exposure about plant-based margarine, um, or plant-based foods around uh, altogether, that availability heuristic influences how people make those decisions. And so The big challenge is that the media doesn't necessarily give a fair representation of how that uh, how that news fits into the the broader risk uh, categorization, and also often exploits the scientific research that's going on. And there are now uh, within universities and research institutes um, media groups that just do public relations related to the research that's out there. And these media groups, in some cases, are very powerful, influencing the information that's published within the Canadian or within the Canadian or uh, global media about about different products and about different scientific understandings of these products. The affective heuristic. This is different. Um, this is where we often link out our decision making to our emotional state, and so. In the case of food products, we're often just talking about the aspects of pleasure and perfection and improvement, but also guilt. And we use we use these affects, these emotional um, expressions when uh, developing advertising campaigns for foods. And it's it's important to think about how are we expressing this. It, I realize that within Canada, we have some very um, well-defined and strict guidelines about um, how we ad can advertise food products. At the same time, there's lots of gray space in between and um, discussing the, um, the emotional response of foods or having, having smiling, happy people in your food advertising 
implies some of these aspects of uh, pleasure and perfection that may be occurring from that product. We also take advantage of guilt that we can, uh, we can um, try and uh, move people away from other brands towards our own because you can somehow imply that your product is going to cause less harm to you from a consumption perspective. So how do we uh, step out of all of these um, all of these different ideologies into more facts? Well, part of the challenge is that we've got to use scientific literature more effectively. The challenge is that there's literally hundreds upon hundreds, if not thousands of papers published on a daily basis. And sifting through the quality of that information is difficult. And I, uh, you could have a whole slideshow just on that topic. Um, but identifying papers that have good credibility behind them, identifying papers that have good quality, we have a whole slideshow just on um, the quality of the scientific literature. And I do encourage you, if you haven't watched that video, to, to take a look at the video on, on uh, evaluating uh, nutrition scientific literature. We need to define risk appropriately. And that is where we're looking at the consequence of risk multiplied by the frequency. And so in many cases, our risk is greater because it's a low consequence, but really high frequency activity versus something that has a really high consequence, but is extremely infrequent. And we, we tend to pay attention to consequence more than we do to frequency. And that really changes how we, uh, how we communicate risk. We do need to define risk reduction in meaningful ways. I think I have a different video at a, at a different point where I, where I talk about um, how do we evaluate risk and talk about some of the um, the cancer documentation that's out about different food products and um, how the media has portrayed the risk inappropriately. For us as consumers, it's important to parse through that and for us as food scientists to articulate it appropriately. Last but not least, we want to be aware of socially influenced decision making and that peer pressure attributes of decision making are, are so loud right now that having things on Instagram or having things on uh, different social media feeds and amplifying the, the ability of that product to make your life perfect is skewing how the reality of what a food product can actually do or a nutrition product can actually do. The thing is, whoever's the loudest is defining the narrative. And as such, the, if it's a, this is a call out to the scientific community. We need more science communicators. We need more people who are willing to step up and talk rationally about the scientific information that's out there and especially how it defines our food systems. All right, I think well, that's it. So you know where to find me if you have questions. And bit by bit, we're wrapping up our semester together. It has been a real journey together uh, doing these online courses, but it's been also a great challenge for me. And I've enjoyed doing this work with you. And rest assured, I'm not going to stop making videos. I'm going to keep on making more videos just just uh, to improve on my own capabilities. I know that's a one of those uh, perfection paradoxes, but uh, um, in some cases, it's it's a good to have a goal, and one of my goals is to continue con communicating good food science with you. All right, ask good questions. I look forward to uh, your video requests, and we'll talk to you again real soon.